You know, I come to conferences like this and I leave with a, a real sense of wonder. You know, I'm amazed at what people are accomplishing, what they're thinking, what they're delivering. You know, when Ericsson were talking, and I've got a friend in Ericsson who's currently working on 6G. Now, I've barely come to terms with 5G, but they're scientists and coders working in Ericsson in Stockholm, developing the next generation of communication, which of course is going to be a massive transformation of that world. And when Jane comes from Zoom, and the story of Zoom is fascinating. The CEO, Eric, he worked for WebEx. And when Cisco took over WebEx, he was frustrated and he offered to turn WebEx into what he thought would be a far, far better platform. Cisco turned him down, so he left and said, well, I'll just do it on my own. The result is Zoom. So extraordinary perspicacity, extraordinary energy, and belief and vision in both those companies and in a lot of people in the room. So I'm very, very grateful. And I really enjoyed listening to Stella and listening to Joanne and listening to Peter's panel and Janet and Michael. Thank you very much. It's really great to be able to sit, listen and learn. But above all, I just want to thank Learnervate for picking Croke Park. You know, the, I, I've never been in Croke Park before. I, obviously, I've heard of it all my life, but I've never been in it. And this is not just a symbol of Gaelic football and hurling. This is a cultural symbol for Ireland. It's absolutely extraordinary place, and it's uniquely Irish. And I think that's very, very important. It sums up, in a way, what connects Ireland to everything and what disengages Ireland and makes it separate and unique. So it's wonderful to be here. And also, can I just thank the whatever authorities there are in the Irish government for allowing me to use the electronic passport gates Unique in the EU, unique in the EU. I'm sick to death with being put in the other queue and spending 45 minutes while someone thumbs through my passport and stamps it. I've only got a brand new passport, so I've got a blue passport. It's not an EU passport. And it's already half full of stamps from going to places like Spain and France and places that once upon a time I just used to walk in and walk out of without even thinking about it. So thank you, Ireland. It was a joy to get through those gates once more. But what I want to start with is just reflecting back to Leonard's talk at the beginning. And he was talking about the point when the transatlantic cable came in to connect North America with Europe, which was an unbelievably important moment. But I've spent, I think I've been five times, to the place in Darwin in northern Australia where the, the, the last point of the telegraph cable to connect the world, at that point, it went round the world. And it is still there, it's a museum, it's a shed, essentially, nicely, lavishly um, preserved, but it's nevertheless a shed. But that shed represents everything about global connection and community to me. And I think that's what Leonard was getting at in his opening address, global connection and community. And few people know that the reason Alice Springs is where it is, is Alice Springs was a relay station to get the signal from Darwin to the middle of Australia and then down to Adelaide. And those three stations, Adelaide, Darwin and Alice Springs, were serviced by camels. And then they built a railway, another communication and connection. And that, what, that railway is called the Garn, and that's a, a, a tribute to the Afghani camel herders and tribesmen who took all the, they supplied the whole set of Central Australia for decades and decades. And you probably don't know, but that when they finished, when the Afghan, uh, Afghanis went and the camels were no longer needed, they just set them free. There are now hundreds of thousands of camels roaming Central Australia. You see herds of them and no one knows what to do with them. You know, they don't do much damage, but they do damage crops. They don't hurt anyone, and they live along with the kangaroos and so on. They become almost a native animal, but they are there in their thigh. They're always in massive groups. And when you see them, it's kind of incongruous being in Australia and seeing a herd of, of camels coming through. But essentially, everything is about connection. Everything is about innovation and everything is about collaboration and impact. They're the words that Lernervate shared with us at the beginning. And I'm going to kind of, if you like, reflect on those words as we go through the, the session, if I may. I've got three parts. I'm, do, I'm doing an introductory part. Then I'm going to ask you, I'm going to do a little bit of a slido. 
Then I'm going to talk about what, why I think organisational learning is equally as important as individual learning. And then I've got some case studies. So at the end of part two, we'll do a Slido. Now at each part, if anyone wants to stop me, ask questions, no problem at all, we'll do that. Um, and if I don't get through the, all the case studies, hey, you can find them out yourself. I, I really want to get through parts one or two, and two, and I will do that. But before we do that, just you've been sitting, it's kind of hot. We've had a bit of coffee. Lunch is coming, as Jane reminded me. You realise everyone will be thinking, my God, he's between me and lunch. And this is true. I can't do anything about that. That is inevitable. But what I'd like to do, just stand up, because I think standing up is good. Donald Clark does not have to stand up because he refuses to participate in things. Uh, everyone stand up. Just turn to someone and say, what is the big thing you got out of today so far? What have you learnt? What has been wonderful it, with, with the term wonder? What have you taken away? One thing. Okay, can I bring you back? Thank you. Thank you. I actually scanned the room and I, could, I didn't see anyone on their own. I didn't see anyone sitting there, I'm not going to say anything, or anyone not engaged by having that conversation. That's a tribute to Learnovate, so well done. See if I can kind of destroy that atmosphere in, in 20 minutes. <laughs> well, I'll do my best. <laughs> so let's start. Now, Stella had three similar challenges facing R&D, labor challenges, digitization, automation, omnichannel, working with omnichannel, and then the whole issue of employee experiences and employee expectations. We've heard about onboarding already this morning. Now, the difference is that Stella worked really hard to work those out. I just stole them from Bethany Tate Cornell. These are, Bethany's the CLO of McDonald's, and this is what she faces in McDonald's, new in the role. And what I've said is that not only have we got these awesome challenges, but we want to meet those challenges uh, it, with very complex workforces. Now, McDonald's particularly, has, because they've got franchises, they own, they own restaurants, they have staff who are full-time, part-time, temporary, contract, you know, everything. But so, much, so do many of you. You live in increasingly complex employment arenas. And to say, who is an employee, used to be pretty straightforward. It's no longer straightforward. And if you ignore one constituent, you weaken the whole organization. So if you say, oh, we just only deal with full-time staff, you're an absolute idiot. I don't think anyone will be naive enough to think that only full-time staff matter. Or we bring in part-time. Well, what about the contract? Yeah, we have to have the contract. What about those who work for other third-party organizations who work with us pretty much for, yeah, we need to bring. And suddenly, the whole issue of meeting these challenges gets more and more complex. And, and how do we do it? Well, I, I think the sad thing is that we're still in 1863, and we still think you lack wisdom, or we could change that. You lack skills in some things. Let X platform, I won't mention names, bring you the funnel, and we will give you those skills. We still operate with a mental paradigm, a learning paradigm, which is a long, long time ago. And I don't think that picking up that funnel and putting it in front of those challenges makes any sense. And I'm sure most of you can see there's a, di there's a disconnection. And one of my wishes today is if you come away saying, we really do have to rethink the learning paradigm and rethink the learning role in organizations. Because if we don't, we're going to become increasingly irrelevant. That funnel will become increasingly stupid because it doesn't work like that. And we know that, you know instinctively, but we need to know it intellectually and we need to challenge those who think that you have skill deficits, open your ears and eyes. We don't put your funnel, we give you a screen, but it's exactly the same thing. We tell you, you don't know. You don't know, we know, we tell you. We simplify the world so we can package it. When in some ways, what employees need is to complexify the world. And to use that great word, discomfort, we need to discomfort people to get them out of their rigidity and their sense of complacency. But we need to do that with support. 
and security. We don't want to wreck or create nervous breakdowns in 10% of the workforce. But we do need to recognize that the model of comfort and simplicity and reducto is no longer capable of dealing with those challenges that we face. So th this is another model. This is a picture I took kind of outside my front door. There's the shard in the background. This is a Roman mosaic discovered in an area where they're going to be doing a huge amount of building. And the Museum of London gets into every development. And when they dug down maybe 10 feet, they found the biggest mosaic that's been discovered in Britain for 60 or 70 years. And they are gradually working through that whole area and then putting all the dirt back and then building a huge great building on top of it. Now, to me, that is all about not a funnel. This is about exploration and discovery. They didn't know what they were going to find. And when they started to find things, they had to recalibrate and rethink it. And this is teamwork. No one in any of that group, and there's about loads more than that, you cannot say they all know. They all know a bit of the story, and they work together. And then they had a, what do you do with that? Do you just bury it up again under you know, 10 feet of concrete to protect it? What do you do? Do you create a glass floor so that it would be visible? They're taking it away, and they're going to preserve it and, and display it eventually. But it is, it is huge, and it's, this is just one bit of it. It extends all the way down, and it is beautiful. It was a Roman, a very affluent Roman house uh, we, we're at one time in the past. So there are different models of learning, and I think we need to be aware of them. We need to understand the differences, and we need to make choices consciously rather than blind choices. So what, what I've done is just given you... Guess what? You'll notice about those um, five people. They're all men. Yes, correct. <laughs> and if you look at, and that, is a, that, that in itself defines part of their approach to the world. It is not a dramatically inclusive world. But if you look at those people, we, we, in our heads we think Skinner, old fashioned behaviorism, limited. Piaget, constructivism, in our heads, building mental models, so much more modern and so much more advanced. Jean Piaget, 1896. Skinner, 1904. Piaget's older than Skinner. Vygotsky, not much further behind. Same as Piaget, 1896. Vygotsky, zone of proximal development, the idea discovered or published in the 70s. Hey, guess what? People learn better together. When you put them in groups, particularly when you put them in proximal groups, there's a power of learning that goes on. How many people who are plugging in decades of e-learning, where you sit and you do it all on your own, have even thought that maybe that isn't the best way, and have thought about what Vygotsky was saying 50 years ago, and we haven't learned. Keegan, who's a kind of, in some ways, the heritage of, of, uh, of Piaget, Keegan, Piaget stops any interest in research on learning at the age of 18. Why? Because Piaget believed, like many believed, like IQ, the people who developed IQ tests, that when you get to 18, you're an adult, job done. You've stopped learning, you are fully formed, your IQ is fixed, your personality is fixed, and we know that that's utter and complete rubbish. And Robert Keegan was the first psychologist to say, I think there are stages of adult development. And he went on to define three stages, much debated, much researched. But anyway, he at least broke open that idea that if you're 45 or 55, you can still learn, you can still change, you can still evolve, you can still become more impactful in your world. And we're coming to terms with that still. And it was decades ago that he said that. And the interesting thing about Keegan, he focused on the individual. These are the three stages. You must or help people move from stage to stage. They won't all move. You're at the top stage, it's maybe 14% of the population. No one has ever been able to reproduce those figures, by the way. So I'm not, let's just say, Keegan says 14% of the population. But the point is that Keegan realized, where do adults do most of their, most of their development? They do it at work. So his new book, is not about individual development. It's about organizations that help individuals develop. He called them DDOs, 
direct, deliberately developmental organisations. I would have thought learning organisation was pretty good, but no, no, Keegan came up with his own one. But essentially he's saying that if you're really serious about maturing adults and getting them to their full potential, organisations are your boys or girls. It's not all about focus on individuals. How many people in L&D have taken that on board? Some, but not all, I hope more. And Freire, what Freire it, it, we, we call it power models. What Freire was saying is nothing is neutral here. Every word, every position you use is deeply embedded in um, power complexes, hierarchies, um, control, etc., etc. We still haven't learnt way we use our language. And I thought it was absolutely fascinating that when Nadella took over at Microsoft, he gave all of his executive teams, so before our first meeting, just read this book, and it was called Nonviolent Communication. It must have blown their mind. You know, having had Balmer, who was not just a, a, a violent communicator, he'd be, a, he'd be quite able to punch people. I shouldn't really say that because I have no proof of that. But it was, a, you know, there was a confrontational environment. And Nadella gave that book, which says, be careful of your words. Your words are loaded. Your words can hurt, even if you don't intend them to. So let's just try something different. That must have just been... My God, this guy means business. <laughs> the world is changing. And I'm really amazed at how that word is changing. So there's loads and loads of paradigms. Uh, Donald Clark's uh, published blogs on 50, 60, I don't know how many, Donald, 100, loads of different learning theorists. That's just a teeny snapshot. But what I'm saying is that each one is a model of mind. Each one is kind of politically and culturally situated. We should know about these people. You're in learning. And I teach on a doctoral program at the University of Pennsylvania, and we do the learning block, and we blow the minds of incredibly senior people in corporate learning. No, they'd never heard of half of these people. They never even think, they take it for granted what learning is, and they are all about the, the, the delivery, the mechanisms, the evaluation, the management, and all of that stuff. And we send them away thinking much more deeply about what they're doing. And I, for me, I think we should do that. You don't have, you don't meet a CFO who's <laughs> no idea about finance. I just, I just make it up as I go along. You know, I just absorb it from X or Y. You, know, you learn about the models of finance. If you're in marketing, you know about how marketing works or what the theories of marketing are and the politics of marketing. We should know about the politics of learning, as far as I'm concerned. So, what I want to share with you now, this is the model I developed for my workplace learning book. And when I began to research what made learning tick in organisations, I was, I guess, shocked and surprised and then, I think, pleased. But what I found was that if I just focused on learning, the centre of the circle, I'd be wasting my time, completely wasting my time. And what I realised is if you really want to deal with the, the uncertainty and complexity of the current world that we're operating in, you've got to really start focusing on the outer circle. So if you have no trust in your organisation, just kiss goodbye collaboration and sharing. It just won't happen for obvious reasons. Why would you tell anything to someone you didn't trust? Why would you help them? Why would you share anything? And why would you admit you don't know? So organisational culture grows up around layers of protection, layers and layers of not admitting, covering up, deflecting blame to someone else by B BCC emails and all the kind of games that everyone in this room is perfectly aware of. We could write them on a sheet. How do we deflect and protect ourselves? Because we're scared. We live in fear. Largely, organisations live in fear, even up to CEOs. I've worked with CEOs who are absolutely terrified of the board because the board are nasty and they force him or her to do things that instinctively he or she wouldn't do. Therefore, you have to build a real case to be able to shift the board. They don't say, we trust you. They don't trust the CEO in many cases. So trust is utterly fundamental. And then engagement and empowerment follow. And if leadership doesn't follow those through, we're in trouble. And if diversity doesn't articulate all of those things, if you singularly look for those who agree with you, and if you build an organisation around those who agree with you, then you create that complacency that I was talking about. And discomfort is diversity. Diversity is seeing the, the, the world through eyes that are different to yours. 
And that is pretty scary. And we took the students to the Penn Museum, which is one of the most famous uh, archaeo archaeological museums in the world. It, 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 they worked with the British Museum for centuries, building collections. And the African-American students came out of that and said, this is appalling. This is just about exploitation. This is pure, naked colonialism masqueraded as history. This is awful. And I, I'm, I'm going, I, I see your point. I see your point. But I'd been to that museum 20 times, 30 times. I've been to the British Museum 100 times, probably. That has never crossed my mind because I'm narrowly situated, a particular place at a particular time, and I didn't understand. I understand a lot more now. And in some ways, that program I teach on, which is an enormously diverse group of people, it's not just privileged elite who go to an Ivy League college, it's people who've scrimped and saved and worked their way through because they want to do something impactful in the world. That diversity, I sit and learn. Every time I end up in Philadelphia, I learn. I, le I have intense learning sessions with people that see the world completely differently from me. Now, if you can, if you can tap that into that in an organisation, because there's guaranteed to be people who see the world differently from you in organisations, if you can tap into that, you're into somewhere special, and you begin to create a unique resonance in your organisation. And it has to be, though, when they're sharing and collaboration and information moving around. So I'm kind of coming towards part two, which is the learning organization. But I, I picked this up in 2018. It's Deloitte's Global Human Capital Trends Survey. They've done 22 of them or 18 of them or something. I've read every single one of them. I really enjoy them. But I thought they kind of put their finger on it. That I'm not sure calling it a social enterprise was the right term. But that idea of increasing engagement with external actors plus increasing collaboration internally, you're getting something special. And it takes you from a traditional organisation. You could cross out that and put traditional L&D department down in that bottom left corner. How do they become engaged and powerful and integrated by increasing engagement with external actors from within the L&D, so they're not inward-looking, they're outward-looking, and also in the world, bringing information and knowledge into the organisation, and that increased collaboration and internal integration, so that it spreads out across the organisation, so it works for the whole organisation. They call them symphonic organisations. Again, I don't think that word resonates very well, and I've certainly never heard anyone in the whole world ever say, well, we're building a symphonic uh, kind of culture in our organisation. But I think, I think they're a simple, back again to Keegan, let's just call it trying to create learning organisations. That's what they're saying, but they're not saying it, if you see what I mean. So essentially, that's my part one. That's my background. Then I'm going to plunge into organisation. So if you go to good old um, Slido, and the number, if anyone has forgotten it, like me, the number is 274-1468. Go into Slido if you can, and we'll see. Wow. I should have quit when it's at 3%, shouldn't I? <laughs> so, I'd love to be able to have a debate about this, but we, haven't, we don't have time. Maybe we can, you can challenge me at lunch. Okay, we'll stop there. I'll go back. Thank you very much. That's very helpful. Right, let's move on. Um, learning organisations. Now, uh, there's a novel called The Overstory by Richard Powers that some of you may have read. It's an absolutely amazing book. It's about trees. How could you write a book about trees that's 400 pages long? You can. It's proof. He's proved it. It's an extraordinary book. But what he's saying is that when you look at a forest, you see individual trees. But that's not the whole story. When you see a forest, you should see the, connect, the network of connections that link those trees, that allow them to exchange information. They chemically linked, they pr protect each other, they cultivate species, and they in turn protect the, the, the trees against attack. And so they work together. So cutting, so Powers is saying, you cut a tree down in the forest, you don't just cut a tree down in the forest. You actually damage the whole ecosphere. So I parodied Thomas Powers. So this is not his language, this is me. 
Organizations mend and shape themselves through invisible synapses. And in shaping themselves, they shape too the tens of thousands of people that work for and with them. Maybe it's useful to think of organizations as enormous, spreading, branching network, networks of connections. So back to, to Leonard. Now, you could substitute trees there and you get close to powers. But what, what I think, with, with uh, all due nod towards Stella and anyone else who knows more than I do about neuroscience, I see an organization as a brain. And just in our brain, the, the number of neurons we have, you know, 100 billion or so, that, that is not the way we... You're correcting me. 86 billion. 86 billion. <laughs> What's a few billion between friends? The number of neurons we have in our brain doesn't make us smart. It's the connections between them that makes us smart. And each of those neurons is capable of a 1,000 connections. Do the math. It's very complicated. Now, if we can make those connections, keep making those connections, see part of our life is building new connections, learning new stuff, and it's learning that makes connections above all, our experience of being in the world. And I, I was working in San Francisco with uh, the Osher Center, and the guy in the Osher Center said, and I don't think you should re you would ever say it private, uh, publicly, but what he said was, he said, you know, I, I'm coming to think that dementia is a lifestyle choice. Now, if he said that, if he published that, there'd be absolute uproar. But what, it, what the more he's proving is that it's not 100% it's your choice, but there is a huge amount of what you can do to keep your brain and your body going. Keep the body going, the brain follows. Keep the brain going, the body follows. It's all about connections and connections. So if you can think of an organization, if you can think of an organization full of people, then they're like trees. You can see them as individuals, and we can say, we have your personal development plan. This is your competence profile that you have to achieve. These are your individual targets. We will bonus you on these targets. I think you are not just missing a trick, you're actually doing something really damaging to the organization. Who wouldn't leave when it's all about me? I'm great, everyone tells me, I'm bonused, I'm competent, I'll go and find someone who'll pay me more. Because the organization doesn't matter. What you want, is every employee to get up in the morning thinking, thank you for being Zoom, or thank you for being Ericsson, because it's being in the organization that makes you smart. It's not you, it's the connections that make you smart. And we know Boris Kreuzberg, 10 years ago, published a book looking at financial institutions, financial companies in New York. And what he proved, he's got tons of data. It's called sh shooting stars, rising stars, falling stars, I don't know. Just put Groisberg stars, you'll get it. But what Groisberg proved was that you take out these unbelievable rock stars in a financial company, you've brought in not millions, but hundreds of millions of dollars worth of business, and you say, we want some of that. So you buy that person and pay them a vast amount of money to come over, and you put them in your room and say, off you go. They fail. Why do they fail? Not because they're bored or not because they're not trying. They fail because what makes them successful is all of the connections that they don't, no longer have from their organization. And these are unsung, unconscious connections. And I think that in every organization there are unsung, unconscious connections. And by golly, if we can make them more conscious and try really hard to build those connections, we do something special and we do something that will differentiate, I guarantee, your organization. So, if you look at that little graphic, you know, it's, it's, the connections are unbelievable. Just that one tree root. There's thousands and thousands of living things dependent on that. And it in itself is dependent on those. It's the connections that make the forest flourish. It's not the individuals. So I come up with a ludicrous statement that I don't care. I, I think it's true. And I don't care if you think that's the most stupid thing you've ever heard. Learning happens in the space between people in a learning organization. It's not what you know, it's what, who you know and how you can plug what you know with someone else and to do something special. Rather like those, uh, those archaeologists working on that mural, uh, on that mosaic. It's not what they know individually, it's how they connect that brings the knowledge together. So the connections are important. How many of you have even 5% of your role in building new connections? You know, I, I, I was working till God knows when, night before last, with New Zealand on a community of practice. 
And th there is so much more potential in community of practices than, than is remotely scratches the surface in organizations. Wenger in, invented them or invented the term in the 90s. And he's been banging on about it for 30 years. He doesn't he still Wenger, community of practice. You, you Google scholar Wenger, community of practice. He's been writing about them for decades. And he's changed slightly, but essentially what he's saying is the social learning of the group is critical to the health of an organization. And I, and I tend to agree with him. And you don't have to have communities of practice necessarily, but you do need to have just permission to talk to people. How many hundreds of people have I talked to and said, you just need to talk to her? I can't. I'm not allowed to. My boss says I'm not, I have to do this. How ridiculous. Well, you've not even got permission to speak to someone in the same room, there alone, in the same team. You can talk to this group on this, because that's the project. Focus on the project. And the, the idea is that all the knowledge, all the potential for sharing knowledge just runs out the room at a rate of knots. And when you run out the room at a rate of knots, it's really damaging and unfortunate. So this, this is self-determination theory. Uh, developed by Richard Ryan and Edward Desi. Um, Richard's, I've met Richard, he's in the University of Syracuse, he's still around, he's in his 70s now. And there, if you, don't, if you think, oh, this looks a bit, bit flaky, go and look at the research. I can tell you it is not flaky. It's decades of research. What they're basically saying is that to motivate people, you have to have a feeling of a choice. So you are doing stuff you want to do. The feeling that you're effective, and it's not just I'm skilled, you're effective. And effective is from other people, not from yourself. But the third one is really important, relatedness. The need to feel connected with others. So Desi and Ryan are saying that if you create organisations full of people that are connected, are, I was going to say eulogised, not masters, masters in their own domain. And they have that feeling that they have a choice in coming to work, in doing what they do. You unlock superpowers, absolute superpowers. And that is really something that is open to everyone in this room or not, if you choose not to. But just reflect on what I've said. What I'd like you to do is the second, uh, quickly while we finish, this, I've got my buzzer going in my wrist. So if you can just have a look at the second slide out which is just, just tell me how you react. You know, you can say rubbish. Uh, that would be one word. That's okay. But I, I would like some, just some reactions to what I'm saying. It, am I making sense to you? Is there, do you think there is such a thing? You know, I'm dedicating my life from the moment to organizational learning. I'm going on and on and on about it. I'm writing a book about it because I think it is absolutely critical. We knew about this stuff in the 1990s and the, and the early 2000s, and we somehow forgot about it. So I've gone back to Argaris and Senge and all these people who thought they'd kind of cracked it. They died happy, thinking, yeah, every organization would be a learning organization. Little did they realize that before, the, before the, they were cold in the grave, it had all disappeared. It had all gone off. Right, thank you. Yeah, asking hard questions. Thank you. Being willingness to listen. Brainstorming. Yes. Collaboration. Creating spaces to connect. It's really important that one of Wenger's statements is that we need social learning spaces in every organization. Simple. Unbelievably difficult. Go and have a look. You go into a, 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 an office and say, where are the social learning spaces? Well, there's meeting rooms, but basically they just sit there and work. There has to be a, a middle ground. One of the things I loved about Zoom was that the CEO published a paper saying, hey, if we're going to get people back, back to the, our offices, we've got to make them really special. We don't just order them in. We make them so desirable, they want to come in. What do they want to come in for? Brainstorming, collaboration, coming together. All of these things that you've put on, on the wall. And building those social learning spaces. And every office, I know people say, Z what, what is Zoom doing having offices? Well, they, it's not quite like that. The world doesn't work like that. And they're trying to build a really fantastic workspace so people feel empowered and connected. And they did it brilliantly, I think, over, over COVID. I was astonished. I've got, I know somebody who works in Zoom in San Diego, and I, I, she was just telling me the things that were going on there. It was absolutely amazing. But these things, just take one or two of those, and I just think you could change not just yourself, not just your team, 
but your organisation. Thanks very much. Thank you.